afternoon, everybody. I am Brene Myers and very, very pleased to be here with you. And I love this, the idea of future works and connecting like new ideas with leaders because that in fact is the crux of the matter when we talk about inclusion and diversity. In particular, I love this idea of future because I have been saying for years that any company that dares to go into the future, that wants to be competent and wants to be relevant, dare not go without inclusion and diversity. And I believe that deeply because fresh ideas and fresh thinking cannot come from a group of people. I know it is sad to say, I hate to say it, but no matter how brilliant you've been in the past and even in the present, you will not continue to be as brilliant unless you are inviting in diverse perspectives, ideas, and guess what? They usually come from people <laughs> who look a little bit different than the folks who have been making all the decisions for a long time. And I think that what we are starting to recognize, I know that people have, have understood that there is a value here to diversity and inclusion. They understand that there is power involved in like having people come up with new thoughts and new ideas. We now have enough of the science that tells us that in fact you can't get out of groupthink unless you have those kinds of perspectives and that that's going to create all sorts of creativity and innovation and as be because people's voice are being heard, they're gonna be engaged and they're gonna wanna bring their best and perform and it's all good. So what's the problem? Right, because if we all knew this, if we believe what McKinsey has told us, which is not only is diversity a good thing, but you won't go broke. Like, they've got all sorts of studies that are suggesting that in fact, that if you are in the top quartile when it comes to gender diversity, that you're, you know, 22% more likely to have higher financial returns than the industry median. If you have people of color, it's 33% more likely to have higher financial returns than your industry median. So we've got all this good info. We're like great people. We love diversity and yet I've been in this for 20 plus years, well I've been black my whole life, but in addition to that, <laughs> uh, in addition to that on a professional level, I have been working on these issues and trying to push and try to move and I really started in the legal profession, that is my profession, that is where I started. I started in Boston and I said this morning that I arrived in my law firm in 1985 and I was the first black person they had ever hired as an attorney. Not only was I the first, I was the only. And that seemed quite bizarre to me. Um, it looks different now, but not different enough. And one of the things that we're starting to recognize is it isn't only about race and ethnicity. It isn't only about gender. We have started to expand our understanding to, to note that it includes people of different sexual orientations, people of different languages, personalities, neurochem like chemistry, like all sorts of ways, uh, personalities, communication styles. And what is really powerful is to watch how much this conversation is becoming part of the global conversation. When it was only about the US, and believe me, I was, I was going over to various countries and sort of sharing and doing workshops and people would say, oh no, that's just a US thing. Those poor US people, they have such a terrible past, you know? And, uh, and uh, I was like, mm, okay, I think it could be over here too. It just looks a lot different or maybe not so different. Certainly I can talk about the issues of women all over the world, sadly. Um, but we are also recognizing in each, each particular country or region of the country, the concept of diversity, that is difference and commonalities that we share across different uh, cultures and identities, uh, that's actually prevalent everywhere. It just looks a little different. But when we're talking about inclusion, 
which is the next step. So we were going diversity, 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 and then we would like invite people in, and then it would kind of level off, and then we would be like, I don't know what's wrong with those people. We were nice to them. They just didn't work out, you know. Initially, you're like, we can't find the different people. Where are they? Um, and then it was, we found them, but they didn't like us. Um, and now we started to recognize this concept of inclusion. And so I thought that for a minute, I would just talk badly about my law school. Um, I don't know how many people are from the same law school. If you want to raise your hand, if you are, it's OK. Do we have, I am the one and only. I find that hard to believe, OK. Uh, but one of the things that I really recognized is the more I started doing this work on inviting difference, I started recognizing this missing link, which was around inclusion. And I had gone to a, a wonderful weekend of women at Harvard Law School. And they had a panel of these lovely women, the women who were in the first class of women at Harvard Law School in 1953. And they were recounting their experience experiences at the law school. But one thing I did not expect them to say is that as part of their experience, their onboarding, they discovered there were no toilets for the women. So some of you have heard of this story, many of you have not, which is that somehow they, you can only imagine, how long did it take for these folks to figure out we need to have women come to the law school? It was, it was years. Harvard was not in the forefront. So they do all of that conversation and all of that thinking, right? And somehow, nobody remembers the bathrooms. And you laugh, but this is the issue around diversity or not having enough of it, is that we can only see what we can see. And that there is so much more to see if we are humble and curious enough but it is unlikely that we will know that unless we have difference sitting at the table. So, you know, I can imagine when these women brought, they did bring the issue to there. They said, you know, like, you know, back then, as women, we were a lot, we were different. We said things like, hi, yeah, we don't want to make trouble or anything. Like, we're so grateful. We're so grateful to be here. We are just looking forward to this experience. It is so lovely to be a trailblazer. But we were just wondering, where are we going to pee? You know, so <laughs> this, is, this is like how we would do it, right? And this is how people do it when they are invited into institutions in which they have not been well thought of. They are just always like, look, we don't want to make, we're grateful, we don't want to make trouble, but there's some basic things that we need. And I can imagine that some of the men said, oh dear, we must get, oh, how could we have forgotten that? Oops. Um, but I'm also sure that a few men were like, see? I told you, they're going to want things, <laughs> right? Because that's usually what we do. <laughs> you know, maybe it'll be people from a different generation. Maybe it'll be a person with a disability. Maybe it'll be a person who comes with a different language or whatever. And the feeling is, the philosophy is, either you get with it or you may have to find another way or place to be. And because, you know, hey, it's going to cost us more money to put toilets in for women, right? It's a budget. The budget guy will be there saying, hey, see, this is why we didn't do it before, you know? Um, meanwhile, I think Harvard Law School has figured out, both by having women weekends and people of color weekends, that they can make a lot of money. Because when people come back and they are not underrepresented and they are getting to see the, the amazing capabilities of their colleagues of that particular background, they're more apt to give. But that's not the foresight that was there before. It was like they were doing the women a favor. So anyway, they actually decided to put a toilet in the janitor's closet in the basement of a building on, Harvard, on Harvard's campus. So then what is that message? What is the message when you arrive in an institution and something basic, something about who you are and the difference that you may bring from who was there before is not acknowledged or noticed? 
This is actually not, this is a question out there for you. What's, what's the messaging there? We don't want you. What else? Sorry? Speak up. Second class, thank you. What else? Not valued. What else? You need to conform. In fact, I think about the fact there were women on that campus. They were in the secretary roles, and they were also in the libraries. And somehow, I think they did what a lot of people do who are marginalized, is that they develop incredible skills, right? So I'm sure they were like, <laughs> you basically cannot drink past 8 AM, right? <laughs> Um, or, you know, we've got to align our beverage intake with our lunch period so we can run down about 10 to 15 minutes to Harvard Square and then get back in time. But the women were able to explain that it's actually it's going to disadvantage us in some ways, given the fact that we'd have to go 10 to 15 minutes to in between classes and in exams. And so one of the things that I have started to learn as we're doing this work is that inviting in difference is great, but inclusion is the higher standard. And if you're not going to do inclusion, you might as well not do diversity, because you are not going to get the benefits of diversity. When I'm talking about inclusion, really what I'm trying to talk about is how you develop a work environment. And it could be, it's a company, it's a team, it's a floor, it's a country, it's a region, it's an office, like how do you develop an environment where people feel expected? When they're expected to have a brilliant idea, no matter what their role is in the company, or how long they've been there, or what, their, what generation they hail from, or which office they're coming from, are they expected to make a great contribution? Um, is even ex are you even expected to be in the role that you're in? I still have situations where people are not recognized for who they are. Like they come in, they're the leader, and someone is like, comes in the room after them and says, hey, yeah, I'm looking for the leader. I'm looking for the partner. I'm looking for the managing, whatever. And the person's like, I'm right here. I'm not sure why you didn't notice me or assume that I wasn't that person. And that's another aspect of expectation. We still have people who are a lot of men of color, especially black men, often sort of perceived as not belonging somewhere or asked to show their credentials. These are all small but large messaging about who is expected. And also, are you reflected? You know, are, are, are the policies speaking to who you are? Are they thinking about your, your life? Like when, uh, when we're looking at structures and how things are set up, is it accessible to people who have vision problems or who have other physical um, or other types of disabilities? If we're talking about religion, do we know when the holidays are? Do we know what foods we need to serve? It can be something basic like that. Fundamental, though, to individuals for whom this is their identity, right? Not so much for people who know nothing about it, but certainly really important for those who cherish a particular uh, faith or holiday. Um, and it is also about whether you feel respected. So I'll ask you, how do you, know, how do you know when you're respected in the workplace? How can you tell? They ask your opinion. Absolutely. What else? What else? They listen to you. What else? Yeah. They pay you well. They compensate you for your contribution. Yep, what else? What else? They recognize your contribution, and recognition is definitely an area where we could do a lot better. I grew up in the legal space where people were just like, no, because if you tell people how great they are, they're going to want more money. 
<laughs> like, really? Um, or, or they're going to think that they're perfect, and then you might have to fire them, and then whatever. It was always just a lot of, I'm not going to give any kind of love because I don't want to be creating a contract of some sort, you know? And, um, you know, human beings need love. I just want to mention that. Um, another way we know we're respected is you get opportunity. You get opportunity to show what you're made of. You get opportunity to take risks and make mistakes. You get opportunities to redo those mistakes. You, you are given the information. You're on the memo. You're thanked. You're not ignored and acknowledged. These are small and also large things because sometimes there's interpersonal and personal ways in which people are feeling respected. And then there are uh, policies and practices that suggest that you are being respected or not. And so Anna already said this, but the way that I make the distinction is to say that diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. And when I think about it, it's almost like, remember when you were like 13, 14, and you had those weird dances? Did you all have these dances? You know, for the US people, we usually have like this middle school dance situation. It's awkward, OK? Let me just say it's awkward. Because first of all, there's like a weird growth thing that happens <laughs> where the girls start getting really big and then the guys are still kind of small. And then they're all at a dance at a mixer. And then you're supposed to you know, try to go and find somebody to dance with or whatever. And the thing is, is that depending on, I, had, I sort of came into these organizations because I consulted for a very long time. And I would see that people were being invited in but they were on the wall. You know, like the wall flower. They were just backed up against the wall across the organization, just hoping to get in. And I don't mean that um, people can't show their worth and step into the middle of the floor and start cutting a rug. That's a term that we use sometimes in the US like 40 years ago, so I don't even know why that came out today. But, um, <laughs> But it's this idea that, yes, we can be self-starters, and yes, we can be in the middle of the floor. But the reason why I created this slogan is because what I am saying is that some of us are party givers. We are the throwers. We are the opportunity givers. We set the music. We decide when the lights come on. We are in charge. And so as a result, we are the ones who are often in the position to say, come on out and show me what you can do, and or to mentor. And and or develop, like those are things that have to come from the people who have the power and the influence and the opportunity. It isn't just about self-starting. And so I really have learned that it is diversity and then it's inclusion because people will say to me, oh my gosh, we love, we love women like you. We absolutely love you. They're so smart, hardworking. It's just when they do that thing and you're like, what thing? They're like, you know when they do the baby thing? That's a problem. That's a problem. You know, I'm not sure how this job works with that. And I'm like, okay, well, they are perpetuating the human race. So I'm just thinking <laughs> we might want to try to figure it out. Um, but it is this thing where people are like, I want difference, except I don't want to be different. I don't want to do anything differently. I don't want to change compensation. I don't want to look at this policy different. I don't want to open this new bathroom. I just don't. Can't we have difference and be the same? My answer is no. So we've gotten that out of the way. Um, so now let me also talk about another barrier that I see. In addition to not seeing inclusion, what we discover is even when people want to be inclusive, they're tripping over their own unacknowledged, unconscious bias. And as such, what I have understood is that our unconscious biases are making it hard for us to run a meritocracy. Now, most of us, especially in the legal space, are all about the meritocracy, and we may get there a little bit closer than a lot of other institutions. But what I have discovered 
is that if you don't believe you have unconscious biases, it's unlikely that you are able to create a meritocratic environment. Why? There's actually a great study at, out of MIT recently called The Paradox of the Meritocracy. And what they were saying in that study, because they looked at a bunch of companies and they looked at a bunch of managers and leaders, and then they were able to uh, interview people who work with them. And what they said was, if you think you don't have bias, you are the most susceptible to acting on bias. So if you're like, I'm a good person, I don't know what that lady was talking about. I'm a good person. I don't have any biases. You are probably the problem. Um, and, and it's because, I mean, I super appreciate that people are coming from this, you know, this sense of their explicit views about fairness and meritocracy. All good. But now what we're hearing is from the scientists, those who are neuroscientists as well as those who are social scientists, is that if you're human, you have bias. Why? Because your mind is trying to sort through a bunch of stimuli extremely quickly, and the only way it can do it is by taking shortcuts, which is to say it's looking for patterns and themes and schema that go together. So that instead of processing all of the information, you can say, oh, this goes with that, therefore it must be this. And I think many of you, if you've listened to my TED talk, know that I tell a story on myself about being on a plane and hearing the voice of a female pilot and getting all excited about it. Yay, women are in the pilot seat, we're moving up, all good, dancing, all right. Then it gets kind of turbulent and bumpy on the ride and I'm thinking, ooh, I hope she can drive. <laughs> and I don't know that's bias. I only discover my bias when I'm coming back on the other leg and there's a male pilot and it's turbulent and bumpy. And I notice I have no such critique of the male pilot. In fact, it's the exact same situation, but I am questioning the competence of the woman and not the man. I know nothing about either of them except their gender. And that's how much we are set up, even in our most, you know, our best selves, to actually contradict our explicit bias. In fact, the scientists say that it's our unconscious or implicit, sometimes people use the word, or cognitive bias that is the better predictor of our behavior, not our explicit views. Now, when I heard that, I was just really bummed because I'm like, but if you're a good person, that doesn't help. They're like, no, no, keep being a good person. Just know it's not enough because you are more apt to act in accordance with things you don't know are shaping your worldview. So I thought that maybe I'll show you an example of this. So let's see. So I'm gonna show you a couple of words and you have a piece of paper and a pencil or a pencil there and some uh, and you can uh, write down the name. So I'm asking you for the first name of the person that occurs to you when I show you a particular word. This is what we would call an automatic association. Just like in the plane, all my brain is doing is saying, big tube in the sky, guy. That's all it's doing. That's how primitive, <laughs> that's how lazy it is. So I'm going, and they call that automatic associations, and so we're going to do a couple of automatic associations. So everybody good? Now, as I read clearly, you don't linger. You, it's automatic. You're going to try to write down the first name that occurs to you. You don't have to do the full name. You're just like, just get a name down there. Everybody good with this? You ready to roll? Okay, here's the first word. CEO, write a name. Okay, next word, general counsel, write a name. Okay, next word, administrative assistant, write a name. 
<laughs> you're like, oh no, she's going to get us. <laughs> All right. So for the people who are for CEO, how many people wrote the name of a woman? Whoa. That's OK. OK, I think I'm seeing four. OK, how many people wrote the name of a man? I think I'm seeing a lot more. OK. Uh, how many people wrote the name of a person of color? Someone who's Asian, African, Hispanic, Latino, Native American, whatever, descent. OK. How many people wrote the name of a person they perceive to be of European descent or white, Caucasian, however you use the term? OK. All right. Many more. OK. Uh, how about anybody write the name of an LGBTQ person? OK. I see one. And two, anybody write the name of someone you perceive to be straight? Yes, everybody else. OK. All right. For general counsel, men? OK. Women? OK, so look, now that's different. So we can talk about what that looks pretty balanced. OK. What about um, people of color for general counsel? OK. White for general counsel. OK. And then let's go administrative assistant. Man? Three or four or five. Woman? OK. <laughs> Person of color, okay. White person, okay. Straight, okay. LGBTQ, you get the point. All right, so tell me what you think was happening for you when it came to like who you selected and also sort of what you saw with regard to the general room voting. So what do you think is happening? Why do we, do we know some CEOs who are women? Yes. Why are the majority of responses male? Okay, so numbers, right? What else? Sorry? Number, name the name that you're most familiar with. What else? Anything other, any other explanations? People just think CEOs should be men. All right, so um, yesterday, oh no, today I was actually saying that, um, that, uh, you know, you're ever having a conversation with a friend and your friend says, hey, I just came from the doctor and the doctor said this and the doctor said that and you're like, well, when is he going to see you again? And they're like, oh, no, no, she's a woman. And you're like, oh, that's where you just caught yourself in unconscious bias. Or, oh, your Uber driver, your Uber driver picked you up. Was he great? Well, she was awesome. It's because our brain is going for what it knows and what it's seen. It's been primed over and over again by the numbers. The numbers, however, are a result of unfair, historical overrepresentation of a certain group. So you see what the problem is? If we're trying to change the status quo, we have to stare at what old unequal exclusion has produced and somehow think of a different landscape because our brain is not bad. It's just choosing over and over again what it sees. We call this descriptive and prescriptive bias, who a person can be and could not be. The problem, of course, with this is that when we start looking for CEOs, we may miss someone who doesn't fit our description of what a CEO looks like, talks like, comes from, what school, what background, what experience, what industry. When we're looking for an administrative assistant, we may forget that someone is capable of doing a particular job that looks different than what we are primed to see over and over again. Prescriptive means that you can't, only, women can only do this this way. Right? Or men can only be uh, good if they're this or that. That means that you have set out how it is people are supposed to be. 
One of the things that we know is that as we're making decisions, if we are not aware of our biases, we will keep replicating the overrepresented group. And that is a very difficult thing. I will even tell on myself on this, which is that uh, I was in, um, I feel like we're in a club, it's getting kind of darker, and then it's getting lighter. I don't know if people are, is the, is the ball gonna drop? I'm not sure, but um, drinks are welcomed. Um, but, I, but I was also, I was in a market late at night, and I was coming down on the elevator, and I saw this woman, it was a black woman, she was short, she, okay, let's just say she was a lot shorter than I was. She had on some scrubs, and everything in me wanted to say, I love nurses, but I've been doing this work for a while. So I was like, don't you dare. Don't say it. Don't say it. But it was still here. I was like, a black, short woman in scrubs, nurse. That's just where my head went, but like, luckily it didn't come out of my mouth. So then I tried to come up with an, um, a question. So I said something like, oh, so what's got you um, out so late? And she said, oh, you know, uh, I work at so-and-so hospital. I was like, okay, good, because you know, sometimes people wear scrubs for pajamas, but I thought for, for the most part, she must have been from some hospital. And so I was like, oh, that's so interesting. I'm like, um, and what were you doing? And she said, oh, I was delivering, you know, babies as an OBGYN, and I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you that you didn't go with the nurse. Now, is there anything wrong with being a nurse? No, I love nurses. That was the point. I wanted to show how I was a good person. However, what is it like to have worked as hard as doctors work to get to where she is and could never be part of people's description of what a doctor is or looks like? What is that feeling that gets reinforced over and over again? And, and also, I'm a black woman, and I'm sure she'd have been like, sister, really? I got to deal with you now? OK, so because a lot of times, people have higher expectations. They're like, you should know better, right? And the truth of the matter is that as human beings, all of us, all of us have bias. It's not just some of us. All of us have to figure, and it's not just bias for, it's also biased against, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. One of the things that I would love us to do, and I've done this all over the world, and I promise you will survive, is I'm just gonna go back into the black church tradition. Has anybody been to the black church here? You, you visit, not many of y'all visited, okay, so you're not aware. We talk to our neighbors a lot. We talk to our neighbors and um, we're forced into it, but somehow we do it anyway. The minister tells us what to say, we turn to our neighbor, we say it to our neighbor, and then we turn to this other neighbor, and then we say it to the other neighbor. So here's what I would like us to try today. I would like you to say to your neighbor, neighbor, I'm a good person, but I have biases. Okay, now look, you don't need to explain what your biases are. We don't need to get that deep, but, you're just going to do a little confession, okay? So I'm gonna to count to three, we're all gonna do it together. You're going to one neighbor, and then I'm gonna say one, two, three, and then you're gonna to go to the other neighbor. The word, the, it's a simple statement. It is, neighbor, I'm a good person, but I have biases. Is everybody ready? Now, by the way, I don't know how they figure out which neighbor you go to. You go to just kind of figure it out, okay? Everybody ready? One, two, three. Neighbor, I have biases. I'm a good person, but I have biases. One, two, three. Neighbor, I'm a good person, but I have biases. Oh my gosh, we're still all here. Everybody, you see that? We're all here. Give yourself a hand, first of all. <laughs> this is the beginning. If you want to keep going, and many of you have already, you might even go online and test your biases. Now that you've gotten out of denial, you can go and look at Project Implicit, 
which has done an incredible job of giving us a way to measure our biases, and this is both in the United States as well as in other countries. Uh, there are at least 14 differences that you can be, you can judge yourself on. It could be about race, it could be about age, it could be about gender, it could be about uh, foreign versus uh, other countries. It, they have all sorts of the LGBTQ, religion, you name it. And basically they're asking your explicit views, and then they're going to ask you to push different sides of the keyboard as you see different pictures and words, so themes um, go together. And they're going to ask you to do some matching. They're going to switch it and confuse you. They're going to keep asking you to go as fast as possible, because the social scientists know that if they ask explicit views, everybody is awesome. But if they actually figure out a way to measure how quickly you can associate a positive word with an older person, versus a negative word with a young person, and then they'll switch it, and they'll say, if you see a negative word and an old person, push this side of the keyboard. If you see a positive word and a young person, this and you, at the end, will get a score as to who you prefer. Now, one of the things that we have seen is in this race concept is that um, in the US, in particular, there'll be like 75% of white people who say, I love the black people, I really do. Um, but apparently, <laughs> it's not true. Um, <laughs> because there will be like, you know, as many people who say they do as they don't. In fact, I think it's 70, 75% uh, of white people taking the test prefer white. What is also tragic is that 45% of black people taking the race test prefer white too. So if you're a woman and you're still and you're still worried about the pilot, that's it's just we all get shaped by these seeing certain things, not seeing other things, and having a lot of misinformation. So it's really important for you to go check, right? And then some people are like, I feel so sad, because no, you're like, no, you're not sad. You're a human, OK? So just like keep that in mind as you go through this. Blind Spot is also another book um, written by uh, uh, Mazarin Banaji, who is a professor out of Harvard and was responsible, one of the scientists, for putting the um, project implicit together. So that's something I really want to um, encourage you on. I also want to talk to you about the way that some of these biases slip out. They're called micro inequities or microaggressions. How many people have heard this terminology? OK, good. So I will just give you some examples. And none of you have said any of these things, nor will you after today. Um, you know, I love poor folks are like always like, you know, you don't seem gay to me. You just, you just seem normal. And you're like, thank you. Uh, I'm sure you were trying to compliment me. You know, watch your compliments. Because that's where you can actually often see embedded negative presumptions. And so you're like, oh, so you started here. That's why you're complimenting me, right? But what in, in sort of in that compliment is a real sort of clue about where you were starting in the first place. Um, you know. This one, is a, this one is hard, right, because we're so curious. And we walk up to people, and we're just like, where are you from? Right? And they're like, Jersey. <laughs> and then you go, no, 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 I mean, where are you from from? First of all, if you're doing from from, you're, you're in trouble. That's just a big one. You could just say, anytime you're doing from from, no. If you aren't able to say, you know, well, how do you identify ethnically, or where's your, what's your uh, country of origin, if you can't get out one of those basic questions, then it may mean that you don't have the relationship that you need in order to ask those questions. Um, and you also don't want to be going after what you perceive to be the difference uh, between you and another person um, when you're first meeting them. Or worse yet, at a fabulous DNI reception for new employees, right? So, because this is usually kind of where it happens, right? So, you're trying to find the commonalities, build the relationship, then you can go into people's business about where they're from. And if you can't take Jersey, 
for an answer, you, uh, you're in trouble. Okay, so you just got, if you can't figure out how to say it, you just got to go with Jersey. Um, your English is so good. Now, this is really an important thing I find for a lot of people, not just, not just US Asian, but lots of people who've been living in a country, um, were born in a country, right, but somehow are still perceived as foreign by others. And so they're being complimented on their English, and they're like, thank you, grew up in Kansas. Um, using the word qualified, but only with certain groups. So you're always modifying certain groups with the word qualified, but you don't feel the need to do that with other groups. This is often a sign that either you're concerned about what people's biases are, or you have your own. So important to sort of pay attention to that. Um, sometimes it's about body language. It's about how receptive you are to someone, um, how aggressive you are. Sometimes it's about interrupting certain people but not others. Sometimes it's about um, you know, explaining or what we call the stolen idea. This happens a lot with women where they're making a presentation or they're ask, they make a point and somehow that goes unacknowledged until it's picked up by Ben. There's no Ben in the room, right? Okay. Oh, sorry, Ben. I'm not talking about you. Thank you. I'm not talking about Ben. Um, it's hypothetical Ben. Um, might say the same thing, and people are like, oh, Ben, fabulous, fabulous. Um, and, and, and Claire is like, is there a Claire in the room? Oh, is there a Claire? Okay, I'm not talking about you, Claire. Okay, Hilda. Is there a Hilda in the room? Okay, no. And Hilda's like, I swear I just said that. I really feel like I just said that. Like, how is it that I am not being acknowledged? And then what happens is that it often becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because Hilda stops talking because she doesn't feel like she's heard or acknowledged or recognized. And then little by little, people are like, you know, Hilda, I don't know. She, I don't know what happens to her. She kind of lost her. She's off her game. I don't know. Or what we're finding also is if you're in other countries, it's what dominant group is in that country as to like um, who is favored and who's not. And so, and or it could also be like introversion versus extroversion. Like we've decided that if you're not talking that you have nothing to say, right? Instead of recognizing that maybe we want to develop a different kind of environment that encourages people from different personalities to, um, to be able to contribute in different ways. So people are like, no, I'm not sure this will work because they can't stand up and they can't do this and can't do that. And then you might look at other people who seem to have the same uh, way of presenting, but they may be in the majority group, so there's more variety of people within that group or more people allowed in that group to be unique, whereas in some groups, if there's a negative bias, then that's the assumption that that person is not going to be making the same kind of contribution. Um, there are all sorts of ways, if you read the book Quiet, that you know we deeply need introverts. <laughs> uh, we need people who are thinking in a different way, speaking in a different way, but Sometimes our systems are set up only to see or prefer the value of an extrovert. So there are lots of different tiny things that people do that we need to actually pay attention in order to create more inclusion and more opportunity. I will also say that there's a part of our brain that is still quite primitive. It's the amygdala. It is still dividing in like me and not like me. Right? It's still looking for the tribe that you belong in. And if the person is like you, you're more likely to feel comfortable with them as a result, build relationships with them as a result, be much more sort of uh, um, judicious and flexible with how you see that person's input. If they're in the out group, any mistake they make is proof positive to you that they actually were not going to be good. And some of you, I know, I have talked to people, I've interviewed people like, I can tell a star the minute they walk in. I know who's going to make it, and I know who's not. And you're like, and that is exactly how it's going to be. Because what the scientists are telling us is that once you have a presumption, you're going to do all you can to make sure that your presumption is right, including ignore any information <laughs> that suggests you were wrong. So often, if we think a person is a star, we make them a star. If we don't think they're a star, it is unlikely that they can get up out 
from under our presumption of who they're going to be and how they're going to perform. Again, a real problem for meritocracy. Um, here are three things that I think I see a lot in the far, as far as biased behaviors. I see this idea of, in particular, in-group favoritism. So that's, that's the bias for your group. Not a bias against a group, but a bias for your group. You feel like you understand them, you can predict them, you have confidence in them, you have trust in them, and so as a result, they often have more opportunity. Leniency bias is sort of what I just spoke about, which is that you're more flexible with people in your in-group. You really insist on the application of standards, like across the board, no flexibility if they're in your out-group. And then also either recall bias or confirmation bias. And that really is this idea that you are only recalling the information that supports what you already believe. So uh, there are many other types of biases, but these are the ones that I think we often get caught up with in our environment, and it makes us less possible to have the kind of meritocracy and to get the best out of people and to get all of that diverse perspective that is going to change us, make us more creative, more innovative, and more profitable. So let's talk about a couple of things that you can do. Um, I would call these clues and tools. One thing is to just do the work of studying. So go looking for your biases. Um, I talked to you about the IAT already. There are so many now studies that help us see how it plays out. I think many of you know the resume study. If your name is Jamal or Lakeisha, you're 50% less likely to get a call back on an interview than if your name is Greg or Emily. Um, which, of course, really changes people's opportunities. Um, there's the Howard and uh, Heidi Rosen study where they're looking at a venture capitalist and they're saying, you know, one part of the business group, it, business school, is looking at Heidi's uh, attributes and another is looking at Howard's, but they're the exact same pieces of paper. But when it's Howard, they think, oh, this person looks like a hard worker. I would really love to work with him and hire him, have him as a leader. Same, same, same criteria, but the group that has Heidi says, mm, she looks like she's kind of out for herself, not a good team player, not sure. She's smart, not sure I would want her on my team. So all of a sudden, you've got to be more likable if you're a woman in order to get the same kind of opportunity. Uh, there was a black and white study where people looked at two memos. It was, one was said to be uh, authored by a African American, the other by a white person, and they graded. It's the same. It's the same memo, but they grade the the two groups grade them very differently. The black one, they are like not up to not partner material. The white, they're like yes, partner material. But the thing that's really incredible about this study is that in the white memo, they don't catch the mistakes. So that's a problem for anybody. <laughs> that, you know, especially in the business of representing people, like that's a problem that you're not catching certain people's mistakes because you are presumed that they are more capable than they actually are. Do your own personal inventory. Look for your own patterns in hiring and mentoring and evaluation. So to say, do I see a pattern in who I like and what I like on resumes and what schools I hire from? Just do, who are my friends? Who do I hang out with? Who do I have at my house? Who has come to my house? These are all, who's on my Facebook? These are all sort of great sort of pieces of information about whether you're leaning, what your in-group is, what your out-group is. And therefore, once you know it, you start looking more critically at the decisions you're making when people are from your in-group or your out-group. The other piece I just want to share with you is countering your unconscious biases by communicating high standards. So there are two ways that people can really play on their bias. They can have standards too low for a certain group or standards too high for a certain group. So they want, on the high one, they want to be convinced that, that, that the negative stereotype they might hold is not true about this particular individual, so they ask, amp up what they're asking for that person. And there's another way where people don't really understand that they have a very negative presumption about what someone's capable of, and so they give them soft pitches, they don't get, put them in the most important work, they really try to do risk-free kind of opportunities for them. Keep your standards high. 
we cannot change our standards in order to make this diversity and inclusion a possibility. But check your standards to make sure they aren't already, biases aren't already embedded in them. Slow down. The work of unconscious bias is because it's our fast brain sorting very quickly. The minute you slow down and ask yourself a question, where, how did I come to this conclusion? Based on what? Is there any counter uh, uh, data that I could look at that would make me change my mind about whether this person should be promoted? Those are the kinds of things that slow you down, asking other people for their points of view. Get more information, especially about groups that you think of as not as being out groups. Um, I remember when my son <laughs> was a teenager, I was like, I don't like teenagers. Look at them. They're all clumped over there. They're up to no good. Um, and really, <laughs> you would think because you know a teenager that you'd be a little bit more open, but uh, one of the things that I think is really missing is that we're living very narrow lives. Uh, very monocultural in many ways, not all of us, but many of us, and therefore we need to get out, we need to connect, we need to understand, we need to get to more information. I, go, I say go somewhere where you're a minority. Make yourself a minority so that you can have that feeling of understanding what you're missing. And then I would also say that that's part of expanding your comfort zone. I remember that um, uh, Anna was here and she goes, if you don't feel comfortable, that's okay. You know, don't, don't worry about it, just go with your comfort. No, I'm gonna say, don't go with your comfort. Get uncomfortable. Because that's where you can start to expand and understand sort of what you're missing or what you're misconstruing. So I'm gonna stop us there. Um, I have one more slide. Um, but I think I'll do this one thing and then we'll go, um, which is this idea of, sorry. Oh, this is not a real back, is it? There we go. One of the biggest challenges is interrupting other people's biases, right? So go looking for your biases, figure out how to counter them, but also learn to interrupt biases. So a lot of us are hearing things they're in our group, we trust these people, but we know that what they're saying and what they're doing and their behavior isn't actually inclusive. And so we need people to be courageous enough to speak up and say, what do you mean by that? Or why are you using that language? Or people like, oh, I can't believe you have to go to that country. I would never go to that country. You couldn't pay me to go to that country. Really? Somebody needs to say something in that situation. Um, and if you hear incorrect language and you know better, you can say things like, no, I really, you know, I had these two guys come up to me and they were like, you know, I'm working with an oriental and I'm like, and his friend was like, no, nah, man, it's not oriental, you know. Um, I was, he's like, it hasn't been for a very long time. But, you know, we need people to do that in the spirit of kindness and compassion, but also with courage. Because if we are interrupting bias, then we are more likely to see our bias and to work across to counter them and then to create the kind of inclusion that we think is necessary in order to make us the best institutions and organizations we can be as we move ourselves into the future. Thank you so much, I appreciate it.